our press conference. Can someone close the door for me, please? I'd like to welcome you to this afternoon's press conference. And I would like now for you to receive our party leader, the Honorable Michael C. Pintar. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, colleagues and ladies and gentlemen of the press. Thank you, thank you once again for attending our weekly press briefing. Today we'll address several issues. One, the government's strategic plan to combat and help the Bahamas live with COVID. Two, uh, just a brief wrap up on the carnival saga. Three, the government's intention to terminate the parks and beaches contract. Four, the government failure to comply with the law in some of the very areas that the government was very critical of while in opposition and even after. And finally, our commitment to study the report that fell short of being a bona fide audit relative to parks and beaches contract. I said in the first press conference and in other places that it's important that when in opposition, our statements ought to be measured, they ought to be truthful, and they ought to demonstrate some consistency so that in the event that we become the government, that is any of the political organizations, we are able to demonstrate integrity in our statements, that they were not merely uh, statements of convenience or expedience, but even when we sit in the chair, we are consistent in terms of the principles and belief we have as an organization. We've seen over these past decades the woeful lack of consistency by any number of national leaders. It does not mean that you do not reserve the right to change your opinion once you are in the chair and you are armed with more information, you may then make the determination that a previously held position is no longer valid. But when that happens, we have an obligation to give compelling explanations as to why we shifted from an earlier held position while in opposition. Today, one glaring example of that is the government's violation of the Procurement Act. The government stands right now today in direct breach of the Public Procurement Act 2021. They are refusing to publish the details of approved contracts and procurement activities within 60 days of the award of these contracts as required by law. Section 61 of the Public Procurement Act states that all ministries and departments shall publish within 60 days of the award of a procurement contract, a notice of the award of that procurement contract. And that the details should include the title of the bid, the name of the procuring entity, the contract price, and the name of the person or company that was awarded the bid. As all of you would be aware, that law came into effect on September 1st. The details of all of the contracts and material procurement of goods and services between September 1st and the middle of October should have been published already. As required by Section 39.1 of the Act, these details should be published in the Gazette or a national newspaper as well as online. The question we ask, with no rancor, just out of concern for good governance and transparency, what accounts for the present delay? Some would say that it is telling that the PLP, which has promised greater accountability and transparency, is already showing that their commitment may have been nothing more than idle rhetoric. 
And so we discovered while we were the government that this was a relentless call for us to be transparent in how we managed the people's money. And in any case, where it was not done in a timely fashion, the then opposition was within its right to call us into account. And so we can make no excuses for that. Similarly, we are saying, they too must now comply with the law and demonstrate that they have the moral authority to govern. And so we demand today that they adhere to the law. The public would like to know the contract details surrounding the outlays for simple things, the opening of parliament and the swearing in activities, how many hotels submitted uh, bids, how much did these activities cost? The public would like to know the cost, the bidding method, and the winning bidder for the new Ragged Island Airport. The public would like to know the selection method for the decorations downtown Nassau. I, I, I love the tree, by the way. And how many bids were received? Who won the bid, and what was the price? We cannot allow the government, or any government, that's why we make no excuse for any shortcomings we may have had. We own them. We can allow no government to flaunt the law. They have claimed that they want to amend the Procurement Act. That is the right of any government to bring amendments to Parliament. But until then, the law stands as approved unanimously by Parliament, and they must follow it. We put them on notice the FNM will monitor any proposed amendments and we will come to the public with our position on them. We are not supportive of diluting any amendment that is going to ensure that we have no teeth in the pieces of legislation. We cannot be supportive of that. They may have absolutely brilliant ideas on how to improve the Procurement Act. We are willing to listen, but we are going to pay close attention. Let me say, while talking about the Procurement Act, uh, something that dovetail into the recent report, which was made even more salacious by the way in which it was characterized. Various ministries and departments and authorities have some fundamental problems in the protocols that we have in place for the financial management of government business. So the report recently released, I do not believe that there's anyone who worked, for example, at parks and beaches, who will take issue with any deficiency that has been pointed out in the infrastructure or the protocols to manage the government's business. What is interesting, though, is that when the Progressive Liberal Party talks about deficiencies in various ministries and departments, they speak about it as if they have political amnesia, as if those deficiencies did not predate the time that the free national movement was in office. The reality is, the reality is we have deficiencies, unfortunately, that has continued in some cases for decades. And it is unfortunate. It does not let the free national movement off the hook because we came in to make the system better. And you will, you will hear over the course of the next month, particularly in January, you will hear the improvements that have been made in a number of ministries, but in particular in uh, parks and beaches. And so it is very important uh, for, for those persons who represent the government to demonstrate intellectual honesty in terms of, again, owning what the present government has not been able to correct when it had authority, and we accept any criticisms where we have not moved it further than it needs to be. Let me turn my attention very quickly to the COVID pandemic, which is still with us. I restate what we have said this past week, the week before, really ever since uh, we have taken office. We are here to work in tandem with the Progressive Liberal Party government to ensure that the Bahamas 
becomes a model that other countries are willing to follow. In the fight against COVID, we believe we need all hands on deck, and we are prepared to work across the political divide to work with the government to ensure that our citizens and our country is protected. More than 275 million cases presently exist. And there have been somewhere in the vicinity of 5.3 million deaths due to COVID. These are staggering statistics. The Bahamas appears to be in the midst of a fourth wave, now at 23,000 cases and at least 713 deaths. For a small country, uh, this is a, a remarkable and sad uh, set of statistics. We expect the government to make the public aware of the challenges that we now face. It is in our collective interest that we are armed with the information because the opening up of the country, the relaxing of measures, unintentionally could send the wrong information to the public that all is well, and it is not. Having come through the eyes of the COVID storm, it is apparent that we are not preparing as a government for the worse. Our national vaccination problem or, or, or plan has stalled raised in the House of Assembly, the question, what accounts uh, for why vaccinations have not only stalled, but appears to have declined under this administration? There may not be a causal effect. So let me, let me just say that clearly. But it does appear that we have a very serious challenge in one, understanding what the plan is, and two, rolling it out with some efficacy. The free national movement, once again, invites the government to engage us fully in this campaign. We would love to stand shoulder to shoulder with government officials, admonishing the public to take their vaccines, to follow the health and safety protocols. Some of you would be aware that vaccinations peaked in September of 2021 and are now at only 30% of the peak. This is despite the warnings of the CDC and the WHO, which shows that people who are unvaccinated are at a much greater risk of testing positive, I believe it's somewhere in the vicinity of five times the amount, and they are at greater risk, the unvaccinated is at greater risk of dying, 13 times more than those that are fully vaccinated. I want to insert here that we support the view of PAHO, that our focus, the government's focus, should be on ensuring wider coverage in terms of the vaccination program. We need more Bahamian citizens to be vaccinated. I believe we're somewhere maybe around 36%. Uh, best practices in other countries suggest that we should be in the vicinity of 70 to 85%. So we are woefully uh, low in comparison to what is ideal for our country. We do believe that the booster uh, uh, shots that are being given, that that program should run parallel simultaneously with widening the coverage. That the only time that we focus only on the three categories recommended for booster shots is if we have a shortage of vaccines to take care of our entire population. If we do not, then we must make sure that the booster program is running at the same time as the widespread vaccination because all of us are aware that there are breakthrough infections even when someone is fully vaccinated. And so we encourage the government to be very transparent with the public in terms of the challenges that we have and to be vigorous in the implementation of the vaccination program. I'd also like to caution the government. Recently, as you'd be aware, the health visa has been, has been canceled. One of the promises that motivated uh, the, the government to act in this way is the promise they made that they want to make life simpler for Bahamians who are returning home from abroad. Well, the initial reports from the very Bahamians that they spoke about is that it is in fact quite chaotic for a number of them who are seeking re-entry into the country. 
It is important, and to borrow from the Prime Minister's own statements at the recent parliamentary, uh, the, the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association meeting, the governments have to be cautious about, and to paraphrase, pandering to the populist view. Now, we are in power as governments to reflect the dreams and aspirations of the population. So if the population are on the same page about it, things that they deem to be important to their welfare, we have a solemn obligation to oblige. But if we are armed with information that suggests if we were to go in a direction because we hear a loud noise in the street, but we know to go in that direction could mean disaster, responsible governments make wise decisions and share the evidence that is motivating their decision. I am not convinced that the government in the management of the COVID pandemic is doing that. We ought to be very careful how we pander to some voices in the society. Ladies and gentlemen of the press, we are recommending that the government modify the screening policies that it has for persons entering the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. We understand clearly that COVID is, does not only take lives, but it destroys livelihoods. And we are interested in the country clicking on all cylinders to generate jobs and opportunities for all Bahamians. However, if the country is overrun by COVID, the variants that we have long been familiar with or the new variant which is more transmissible, the livelihood that we presently enjoy is likely to be strangled. And so we have to be wise and we have to be cautious and we have to have candid conversations with the population about what the risks are. Countries around the world are modifying the requirements for re-entry. They're requiring PCR tests in most cases for persons to come into their jurisdictions. Those who have relaxed it are going back to it. You would recall, once again, the PLP promised that they would have free testing. The rapid antigen test is not the test that was forecasted. And if it was, then it shows a lack of understanding in terms of what is the gold standard for testing to determine whether somebody is COVID positive or not. And so, once again, we are asking the government to consult with the health professionals to review the requirements for re-entry into the country. We believe that the PCR testing, particularly since most of our tourists are coming from the Eastern Seaboard from the United States, testing is more readily available. It's less expensive than it used to be in the US, so many persons can, in fact, get it. And that test should not be older than 72 hours. I'd like to, uh, just in the final very brief comments, shift uh, tension to the parks and beaches contract. The government needs to be explicit. What is the timetable that they are going to follow to pay the Bahamians who have worked, some of them who have not been paid, since July for the work that they've done maintaining parks, roadways, other facilities. It is absolutely important in this difficult period where many families are hurting for the government to be absolutely clear on when they intend to pay these Bahamians. And I did not say FNMs, <laughs> Bahamians. The persons who came and met in this room were from all political persuasions. And we're asking the government to do the honorable thing to ensure that these families can help their situation during this tough holiday season. We're also asking the government to be honest about its intention, because it does appear that much of the narrative that's being put out relative uh, to this authority is to set the stage for the cancellation of contracts held by who they believe to be free national movement supporters. And while I am not prophetic, I would suggest 
that if we were to look at the list today and look at the list one or two months from now, those persons who are calling them who belong to the PLP family are likely to have those contracts renewed. Which would suggest that the decision being made, much of the narrative being shared in the public to muddy the water, is about creating a pretext to eliminate one group of Bahamians from holding contracts to replace with another group of Bahamians holding contracts. At some point, I suggest now, since it is, according to the government, a new day, that that kind of tribalism stops. I've said before, new prime minister, new leader of the opposition, we have a chance to hit the reset button in the Bahamas on how we do business. I would end where I started. We wish for the government to follow the Procurement Act. And just out of curiosity, the report that we don't believe rose to the standard of an audited report, I mean, simply because even the subjects mentioned in the report were not given an opportunity to respond to concerns raised. Some may be very much legitimate, but at a minimum, the subjects of the uh, report ought to have been given an opportunity to read and respond in writing to clarify any matter before it was mysteriously delivered to the public. But I, if I did not mishear uh, any member of the government, that report may have been paid for. If it was paid for, I end once again with the Procurement Act. Was the report, an inverted commas audit, put out for competitive bidding? How many firms bid? How much was the contract? And what was the method used in evaluating that particular authority? I end there only by saying we accept responsibility for anything that we know we could have done even better on. We are here to make better for the Bahamian people, but we hold the government to the same standard. You are in the chair. We want you to lead with integrity. Thank you, Mr. Leader. Um, we open the floor for questions from the press. Have you had an opportunity, and other members of the press, have you had an opportunity to see the statement uh, released by Mr. Cartwright? Good, okay. So in January, uh, the, the government has promised to lay the actual or the final report. Uh, we are studying the report. Uh, we received it um, roughly, well, shortly after the members of the media received it. If you were to refer to Mr. Cartwright's comments in the House of Assembly, I thought he laid out uh, a compelling case to explain some of the items that were already mentioned, that were mentioned at the press briefing of, of the government. Once we have had a chance to study it, we intend line by line to offer uh, a response to what has been uh, contended uh, in the report, but by those persons speaking at the press conference as well. So in, in short order, we'll have an opportunity to dissect it and share. As you think about what the country needs to do to counteract this, are there any specific indicators in your mind that should trigger increased restrictions and, and, and changes in, in how people are able to move and gather? No, I think we are past um, the indicators stage. Our neighbors to the north, from, from, from where we get the vast majority of our tourists, they, they are overrun right now. The numbers are continuing to climb. 
in the US in general, certainly the Eastern uh, Seaboard. Uh, and those persons are coming to us every single day in incredible numbers. So when you ask about trigger, the fact that that is happening in the US and there's f movement, Bahamians as well as tourists back and forth, should already have triggered the government to adjust its policy in terms of requirements for people coming back into the country. Uh, the second thing is, since our numbers are, are creeping up, the government should be more strident in terms of running a vaccination program. They would have studied what we did and they were critical of it. And, and I think they would find among our colleagues that some of us have ideas of our own on how it should have been done months ago. We are here willing to work with the government in order for the government to step up its campaign. We ask a simple question in the House. Now, let me just say, I, I believe people have a right to choose if they want to be vaccinated or not vaccinated. But if you are the chief spokesperson for the government, which is the cabinet, at a minimum, you should be able to say to the public whether or not we are vaccinated. Are all of us vaccinated? Do we have some anti-vaccine? Because if they are not vaccinated, chances are, I'm not going to say 100%, but chances are the level of intensity and the amount of resources they are prepared to allocate, chances are will be less than what is needed for us to fight this battle. I'll give you an example. COVID ambassadors have been removed from the airports. In Grand Bahama, certainly, persons are out in the elements for the most part. I mean, they, you know, they, every time you land and you speak with them, they tell you, you know, we're in, a, we're in a very rough position. What is the reason why we have stopped checking? Now, there may be a sensible and rational reason that I don't quite understand, but I'd like to hear the explanation. And, and so what I'm saying is those measures that we thought could be even a secondary check on whether somebody has e evaded um, authorities at the point where they're boarding a flight. You have a secondary way of checking. Why, why eliminate it? Why, why, why remove it? So, so we're very much con um, concerned. We also need to know how much uh, our vaccines are on island. Can we run the, run the booster program as well as the uh, widening of the vaccination coverage at the same time? Do we have enough on the island? All of these are questions, and I think in real time, the government should be providing the answers uh, to all of us. So to be clear, you think that a, a, a tightening of entry protocols is the only restriction needed at this point? No, I don't think it's the only one. I'm saying that that is, that is certainly one of them. I just don't, I don't get the sense, and, I, and, and from what I observe, the population doesn't get the sense that we are, you know, in the midst of a crisis. Um, and, and I think we have to send a claim that people are dying on a regular basis and, and the government has to, I think, step up what they're doing. And like I said, we are willing to work hand in hand with them. Do you think we're beyond the point of curfews and those kind of restrictions as we enter the holiday season and there will be gatherings and other events? Well, the parliamentary caucus that's here, we've not been invited uh, to the best of my knowledge and I don't know, my, any of my colleagues are, are welcome to, to jump in. We talk with our counterparts on a regular basis. We would love to be a part of the briefings with the medical professional so we can get the information consistently in real time uh, so that we don't have certain expectations that fly in the face of the science. That's all I'm saying. We, we would like to be aware. What advice are you getting from the medical profession? When we were in government, they were invited to participate in the consultation with the medical professional and to raise whatever questions they might have in order to formulate an opinion. We're, we're asking for that same kind of courtesy. We want them to do well on this issue. If they don't do well, we lose friends, family, and neighbors. We can't afford it. Do you have any thoughts on the uh, government's decision to, once again, deny uh, Carnival from operating? Well, some of my colleagues um, uh, will, will, will be happy to speak to that. If you listen carefully to, the, to our leaders' pronouncements, I think the best way to speak this carnival debacle is a term that says a person or a party does not move far away from their propensities. It seems as if it is natural for them to bungle and create centrifuge around the simplest of routine matters. It seems that whenever they are caught um, with a misstep, the first step is to misrepresent and hide. And in this COVID environment, 
It is a very dangerous thing, whereas cutting edge information is needed for us to stay on and ahead of not only the pandemic, but the economic recovery. So here it is right now. The FNMs out of an abundance of caution. This party just sought to set the record straight that the issue of the carnival is almost as old as the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. It started from Sir Lyndon Piddling time. We didn't accuse the PLP of being wrong for being the sponsors of the carnival. When the FNM was in power, they are the sponsors of the carnival. And what that means is, it is the party's duty to ensure that every approval that is needed, including landing on the dock, getting health, uh, immigration matters, Ministry of Finance on the bond, the party, obviously through their governmental power, ensures that it happens for the carnival. We said that because that the way it was done from Sir Linden time, Perry Christie time, Hubert Ingram time, uh, uh, Dr. Minnis time, and it was only during COVID that we saw it unfit to bring the, car the carnival here. And it's true to assume and to say that they would have asked and we would have said immediately it is not safe for that to happen. That did not happen with the PLP. Obviously, the carnival got a written letter of approval which is exactly the way we would have given it from the Ministry of Finance, which sets the whole tone that you can bring your stuff in duty free, meaning that the bond, the way the duty on it, you don't pay a bond, and then you have to ship it back out. What that meant is that the initial discussion on this, there was an approval. Somewhere along the line, the other mechanisms for the health and, and uh, health supplies and, and the other mechanisms may have been slowed. Obviously, there would have been immigrations because they're here. So now, here it is now, the hurtful thing about this. You know, disappointment is expectations not fulfilled. We had almost a thousand behemoths, and we all been going through this COVID, who had anticipated working at the carnival for this Christmas. And you know what it is when you've been going through little hard times and you done lock in, I got this job, and you start planning. And instead of just coming clean for the sake of the behemoth people and their own political integrity, they want to skirt around the issue. I found it even amazing about the reapplying again. Reapplying again to whom? The party in charge is the party that sponsors it and is responsible for all the applications. I would have appreciated if early enough that somebody would just come clean and say, oh, this is the way it is, and dealt with it immediately. The, uh, the, addition, the issue with the Congo did not start because of the spike that we now see in COVID, you know. This started long before that, long before that. And it is a blight on us as a people to have an operator that has been coming here for 30 years. 30 years working with PLPs and f and all of a sudden under a new day to be treated as if he did something wrong when he, just like the Bahamian people, were relying on the Progressive Liberal Party to do something fundamental. For me, this is alarming because it shows that they have not drifted far at all from their previous administration thrust denial and subterfuge. So this carnival issue raises another point that now they're standing firm on that, but we just had blackout. We just had two massive public events just over the weekend. And our health ministers did not, in the midst of this uptick in COVID-19 cases, did not sought to shut those down. We see ministers parading and now and encouraging the NBA teams, which in the normal sense would have been good, in the normal sense would have been good, but in this COVID environment, we don't see any announcement as related to protocols. And the final point as related to the carnival, when you have an operator that knows both parties so well and the Bahamas so well, demonstrating to our health department and our minister of health publicly that he has served in many jurisdictions and have met uh, protocols sufficient for his carnival to operate and he is bringing in those protocols had to go through hell just to get a reconsideration. 
This is sad. And the most painful thing about it, it ain't nothing new. We would have hoped that would have been a new day, but it's the same bag. It's irrelevant whether I believe Carnival should be approved or not. What I believe is an approval and an answer should have been given swiftly. What I believe is something of that magnitude should have been made very, very clear. What I believe is the folly should have been addressed early. And what I believe is they should have taken into account all the sciences, including properly analyzing, even before the condo come here, their mechanisms to be able to present the health procedures and the mitigations uh, necessary for them to even operate before they come here. Other than that, does my opinion matter? No, they already been told to leave. But we, as a party, hurt for those behemoth persons, those fathers and those mothers. See, you think this is just a couple of weeks job, but when you're hurting and ain't worked for a long time, to get a little something that can give you one little four or six weeks worth of grocery, and you're praying God for something to happen in January, is a serious thing. He that feels it, knows it. And it is better not to play with people's emotion and block their opportunities than to stand up there and to tell them, oh, it's here, and they stood on lines in the sun. They went through all the motions to get these jobs. They prepared and started planning in their minds. And then you turn around again for something that you sponsored, you brought in, and tell the behemoth people, no jobs for you. Any, any final questions from members of the media? Thank you very much for coming. Um, thank you very much for coming. Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. We'll be talking to you real soon. <laughs>